On this episode of Lives of the Medievally Rich and Somewhat Famous, join me on a tour of Florence's stunning medieval mansion, the Palazzo d'Amanzani, and see for yourself how Italy's great and good lived. Originally owned by the Davizzi family, this urban mansion was built in the 14th century in Florence by unifying several medieval fortified tower homes like the sort still found in Bologna today. The type of towers that often had no stairs from the lowest floor so that the henchmen of enemy families could not invade, rape, pillage, and burn. Yeah, good times. Anyway, back then, this would not have been an open square, but a malodorous, often plague-ridden warden of alleys and tower homes, many of which were demolished when Florence briefly served as the New Kingdom of Italy's capital in the later 19th century. The Davanzati family purchased the mansion in the early 16th century, which would then go on to serve for two and a half more centuries as a place for the family to promote arts and culture. Sadly, the last heir of the main branch of the family took his life by throwing himself from the top of the palazzo in 1836, after which the building was depressingly reduced to usage for apartments, stores, and a warehouse. During this time, it took quite a beating, really. But now, it has been restored to its former medieval glory, allowing us to step back into a colorful era of pageantry, grace, and elegance, and violence. Anyway, let's go in. Here we are on the ground floor of the Palazzo d'Avanzati, in the central courtyard that acts as a conduit for the entire home. In fact, this style of architecture was innovated by the builders of this home, and is reflected in other palazzi such as the Medici Palazzo. This courtyard used to be open to the air. It basically functioned as both the central connection point for the home, as well as a supply depot. Mules used to enter through those doors from the adjoining alley, laden with wine, grain, oil, firewood, you know, basic medieval household supplies. The courtyard also features the well that provides every floor in the mansion with an internal supply of water, an almost unheard of luxury at the time, even for the super rich of Florence. Ascending the stairs to the Piano Nobile, the noble floor, we find the Great Hall, the largest room in the home, and the one used for hosting banquets and special guests. The walls still feature many of the hooks that all well-to-do medieval homes had for hanging tapestries and other wall hangings. These were sometimes lined in furs such as ver, which not only helped liven up the space, but also insulated the room. Many of the furnishings in here were created in the 15th, 16th centuries, so perfect inspiration for contessas who wished to outfit their home in a similar style, but not on a similar budget. See those stunning windows with their lovely glass panes? In the 14th and 15th century, those were apparently not glazed at all, but rather in the colder months, they were covered with frames of oiled cloth or parchment to let in the light. Glass panels were hideously expensive, you see. In fact, all of the windows in this mansion received the same treatment. No glass panes to be found anywhere in this building until the 16th century, apparently. Oh, and see that regal floor? See those wooden panels? Yeah, those are murder holes that open onto the loggia below, just in case an enemy family or an invading army gets unhealthy ideas that need to be doused with boiling oil. On that pleasant and anxiety-inducing note, let us move on to the famous parrot room, so-called because of, well, the parrots that leer adorably from every lozenge. Likely serving in the Middle Ages and Renaissance as a solar, a sort of living room where reading, socializing, and handwork could be carried out, this space features a ride of trompe l'oeil, optical illusions intended to fool viewers into perceiving expensive architectural features that are in fact just paint and plaster. How about this as the basis for repainting your living room? And a sign of how luxurious this place was in the 14th century? Not only does it have a separate bathroom en suite, it also sports a hearth and a chimney, a feature that was nearly non-existent north of the Alps in this era. Oh, those are 15th century waffle irons, by the by. Waffles then being more like wafers, but still delicious. I've made some over a hearth fire using a medieval recipe and such irons, in fact. This room also features a collection of 14th and 15th century majolica, gorgeous ceramic pieces that were luxury items back in the day. And now, to the bedchamber located on this floor, known as the peacock chamber. In the 14th century, the lady of the house would often spend her day in this room doing handwork, raising her children, with the aids of nursemaids, of course, and receiving guests. Living spaces in the Middle Ages were not divided up in the same manner as today, and privacy was certainly rare, even among the elite. 
the bed currently located here dates to the 16th century and is immensely different from the sort that would have been here in the 14th, 15th, or even early 16th century. Moving up to the next floor, we find another great hall with the same dimensions as the one below it. Aside from providing additional spacing for luscious banquets and celebrations, medieval Italians really knew how to throw great parties, it is entirely possible that this space could have been used to provide dance tutelage to the young ladies and gentlemen of the house. One 15th century household account from Florence actually mentions a piper being hired to come into the home and teach dance to the young ladies, being paid one florin per hour lesson. This stunning bedchamber on the European second floor was the shared bedroom of Paolo da Vizzi and Lisa de Iaberti, as indicated by the quartered arms of their two families that decorate the hood of the hearth. The frescoes in the upper tier charmingly depict the French roman Le Chastelaine de Vergy, written originally in the 13th century in northern France, shows how international the medieval world was. The whole thing reads like a life-size comic book, which is basically what it was. This particular tale was apparently popularized by troubadours performing ballads on stages in the squares of Florence, as described in the Chronicles of the Era. In essence, the tale is about secret love betrayed, suicide, homicide, and a penance-induced crusade. You know, the stuff of a happy marriage. The tale honestly makes the denouement of Romeo and Juliet look like a happy ending, perfect for decorating a marriage chamber. But the feature that transforms this bedroom into one of luxury is the ensuite bathroom, also exceedingly rare in this era. Hell, the Palazzo d'Avanzati has a higher ensuite bathroom to room ratio than the average McMansion polluting the American suburban landscape. Moving up to the third floor, we have one final grand bedchamber. And I hope you're not tired of medieval frescoes yet. As you can see, medieval people really did have a horror of the empty. To the untrained eye, those might look like kangaroos on the walls, but those are in fact the very common werewolf wyvern. I don't know if that's a thing, I'm just making it up. Let me know in the comments below if you have an idea what this thing is. In medieval homes of the affluent, the kitchens were typically located on the top floor, and this town mansion is no exception. This had extremely practical reasons. One, to disperse smoke and smell through the roof rather than smoking the whole house. Two, so that if a fire broke out, and they invariably did at some point, the damage would be minimized. Speaking of water and the need therefore, thanks to the central well that is accessible from every single floor, this kitchen could be supplied with fresh water with relative ease, as could every other floor in fact. This sophisticated kitchen even features a built-in sink right next to the hearth. Although given its diminutive size and proximity to the fire, I very much doubt it was used to wash dishes. According to the museum staff, spinning and weaving also took place here in the kitchen. Note that these items are modern, dating to the 19th century. But, as someone who does both of these things, I would not want to do them anywhere near food preparation if I could help it. Well, before we depart the kitchens, let's take a look at one last thing. A piece of graffiti on the wall that morbidly memorializes the assassination of Giuliano de' Medici in April 26, 1478. For 15th century Florence, the day the music died. The top floor features one last hall, although smaller in size than its downstairs cousins. It was used for audiences with the head of the familia, but apparently was also rented out at various times by the city for offices, hence why there is also graffiti on the walls. Apparently, it was considered acceptable to scrawl on other people's walls while waiting for government hearings and approvals. Aside from daily medieval life, the Palazzo d'Avanzati also houses a collection of late medieval and early Renaissance objets d'art that, although not original to this home, are quite interesting because they are both beautiful and utilitarian. Take, for instance, this fun birth tray, featuring sassy penis-pulling putti playing a silly slap game known as Civitino, in ribald reflection of the youth depicted on the reverse side. A birth tray was a commemorative plate commissioned on the birth of a new member of a well-to-do family. They were usually employed to serve vittles to the new mother after her labor to restore her strength, or to serve refreshments to guests who came to visit her to celebrate her achievement of, well, not having died in childbed. Other interesting pieces here in the palazzo include what you may think is just a painting or even part of a wedding chest, but experts have recently come to believe it was part of a headboard set for a large marital bed. I really need to up my bed game. This gorgeous 15th century cupboard, yes, it has seen better days, but still, I would take it. 
chest settles that provide both storage and a sophisticated place to repose. A 15th century credenza, a sideboard offering plenty of room for storage vessels and linens while also displaying plate and possibly as a place to serve a sideboard during festivities. You would think that with such a massive house, there must have been a massive complement of servants to help tend it, but that seems to have not been the case in Italian city-states until the 16th century. In fact, based on the catasti from the 15th century, a household such as this probably had five or six full-time servants at most, a number that may or may not actually include their slave labor, which was also a thing in the 14th and 15th centuries here. So, given that information, what do you think? Would you like to live in a home like this? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Otherwise, travel creative and stay tuned for your moment of Kitty Zen.